All right, so Alan and Caitlin and I are here with the Doom Spiral. But first, we're starting with Caitlin, who can speed up computers by a million times. A million times, indeed, maybe, perhaps. We'll see. Uh, this seems like we're going to have faster computers that are very large if, if we do this. Uh, so let me show the article. Uh, this is by Singularity Hub, which you know is great. <laughs> when, uh, and this is by Ed Gent. And he's talking about using logic gates uh, based off lasers. And the idea behind using lasers is that they can excite electrons um, at the start and end of the gate much faster than an electrical impulse. And this means you could run computers at a much higher frequency um, than we are currently doing at the moment. And I, they give, uh, let me see if I can't find what the article, uh, there we go. Uh, so using laser pulses to, to generate the electrical signals uh, in the logic gates, uh, you could potentially run processors at petahertz speeds, yep. which, which would be really fast. Now, of course, the big issue is that you can make the traces and stuff using electrical signals very small. Uh, so maybe you can get like a, AL, a small little ALU to this addition at like the petahertz scale or something and get some great speeds out of that. We'll see. But you need to somehow add an optical laser to every junction. Yes. <laughs> A yeah, small this, task for sure. This sounds very <laughs> impractical. It does sound impractical, uh, but it's but that speed though. I mean that 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 overclocking. <laughs> well, you know, I've I've worked with nanosecond lasers, and they're the size of a house. I mean, yeah, yeah. okay. Well, supposedly you wouldn't need a very strong laser. You just need you just need one of the the a pulse laser uh, that can uh -huh. just get the. Um, he wants get the femto electrons flowing. Yeah, but he wants a femtosecond pulse, and you're not going to get that with a solid state laser. But anyway, uh, no, you're not. No. Yeah, okay, this is a <laughs> fundamental accomplishment in in physics of right. electricity, but uh, nowhere remotely practical. No, no, this is many decades, if not it, if not impossible, away. So. Yeah, yeah. All right, but still, it's lasers and computers. So I have to cover it. All right. Well, sure, sure. I'm all for lasers yes. and computers. All right. So I've got. Politics, something I've been worried about, and I, I've, I've been sort of horrified over the last few weeks to observe that the Republicans were right a lot more than I thought they were, uh, starting with Hunter Biden's laptop, which was real, although it sounded bogus. And now um, there's a bunch of people looking into this. And one thing, uh, so I got a bunch of articles here. The Atlantic has an article by Yasha Monk, a very famous guy, about the doom spiral of permissive polarization. And he has quotes, which certainly can fit to my experience. A couple of decades ago, Democrats and Republicans did not hate each other. And now they really do. 60% of Democrats and 63% of Republicans would now not want their child to marry a member, a supporter of a different party. And they mostly, many of them feel that um, if the other party gains control, it will do irreparable harm to the country. So we really are in a very unhealthy situation. And um, I've been trying, like everybody, to understand how we got here. And um, one thing that helps me a lot was to observe what happened on the Democratic side, which is where I was. Um, Hillary Clinton deliberately released this bogus link, which I heard about on the Rachel Maddow show and everything about how some uh, Ronald Trump, uh, Donald Trump server sent some pings to a bank in Russia. And it sounded completely bogus right from the start. And it was completely bogus. And she knew it was bogus and released it anyway as a dirty trick. And that's all come out now. And then there was the stupid um, P tape memo. And this led to this idea that Trump had colluded with Russia to rig the election, which seems entirely and completely false. But I always thought it was from the start. And so did Nancy Pelosi, who I think quite correctly said we should not do the first impeachment because we don't have the goods. Now, Trump was sleazy and corrupt. And he certainly did publicly ask Russia to do things, which they did. But he didn't have a secret deal with Putin. Trump doesn't have any secrets of anything. <laughs> he was controlled by Putin, but not by means of a secret blackmail deal, I think, just by being so dumb enough that Putin could manipulate him. And anyway, um, but so I, but many people believed that. They believed that Trump colluded with Putin. And that helps me understand why so many Republicans now believe that the election was rigged and the Democrats cheated, which seems to me ridiculous and obviously false. 
but they're in the same position as the Democrats were in 2016, where all the people they trust are saying this, and all the people that appear to be sort of independent third parties like Twitter are removing all the tweets that say the opposite because that's obviously false and Russian disinformation and everything else. And so it helps me understand for the first time how it is that so many Republicans believe that the elections are totally rigged. Anyway, which all this uh, makes me see things differently than I used to. Instead of, I think what I what's happening here is the Democrats are doing the same thing Trump did they are gaining power by causing Americans to hate other Americans. This, I think, is the easy way you gain power. You start a fight where people will blame each other, and they're not smart enough to blame their leaders who are deliberately lying to them to make them hate one another. Our leaders are effectively attacking our own people by splitting them, making them hate one another. And uh, we should more logically hate our leaders who are trying to make us hate each other. And I, anyway, that's why I'm really trying to find somebody in the middle. That's why I like Joe Manchin. I like Andrew Yang. These are characters, especially Andrew Yang. Andrew Yang is a very mild, inoffensive guy, which is probably why he doesn't get very far in politics, because he does not do this, tell you who you can hate and blame everything on. Instead, he says, you know, we should all just get along. We should all be on the same team. We should do normal things. And that's not the road to success in politics, but I think it's the way to save the country. So anyway. I was, that's where I've ended up here, and I, I invite commentary. But there's a related well, thing. Go ahead. You got something, Caitlin? I, I would like to point out that there is something going on with the Republican Party that is not happening with the Democratic Party. Um, and I, you touched on it a little bit. Um, and it is a there is a strong appeal to not just divisive politics, but bigotry in politics. And I'm not saying Democrats don't do this, I'm not saying Democrats aren't you know, playing the game as well. But if you look at the ads for a lot of you know, Republican um, uh, people running for office, you see a lot of either flat out racist, uh, content or you see a lot of dog whistling you know racist content and bigotry and xenophobia um and so i don't i feel very uncomfortable saying like the two parties are basically the same because they're both playing the same game i mean yeah that's technically true uh but i see a much more harmful side of politics coming from the republicans right now and this wasn't always the case Right. Uh, uh, Republicans yeah. are certainly the ones that are currently exploiting bigotry. They was the Democrats before them. Republicans have taken that. That was Richard Nixon that moved that over or, around that time. Yeah. Right. Right. That's certainly true. And, and that's and, it. Yeah. yeah and, and now with, you know, with Roe v. Wade looking like it's going to be overturned mm -hmm. and, and the Republicans stacking the courts with, you know, ideologues. I'm not saying that the Democrats are 100 percent better on this, but, you know, this is you know, the, the parties are not the same. No, um, no, even I, though they both have problems, they're not the same. No, I certainly, and I'm glad you bring that up. I'm not trying to say they're the same, but unfortunately, they are both lying to make us hate one another. They're both basically burning down the house of our nation to get personal power, which I thought the Democrats were not doing, but I think it is extremely clear that they are doing it. They're just doing it far less competently than the Republicans. Like the Hunter Biden manages to deal 10 million and the Trump family steals $2 billion. So but they're both they're both driving a wedge into our country, which is how they rise to power. And we need to find better leaders. That's well, what Biden said he was going to do. He said he was going to be in the middle and unite us. And then he didn't. I mean, but this is part of the problem with the two party system is that you, you have to get people motivated to vote. And once in a while, you can get people to vote proactively for you, like they really like your ideas, but more often than not, especially in a two party system where everyone's going to, you know, sort of have some compromises with whoever is being put up on stage, you have to get people to really not like the other person. So then they'll vote for you. That is the current technique to success is you rise on a wave of hatred for the other guys. But that, of course, rises the individual politician to power at the expense of destroying the country. And we need a better approach. And that's why I like Andrew Yang. He's really not doing that. 
He doesn't have much of a bad word to say about anybody, but he wants to make a party in the middle. He's not a very good candidate, though, probably because of this. He can't get many people cheering for him because he's not selling a message of hate. Right. So maybe a more cooperative politics in the future, something where people are, where politicians, maybe we should change the game a little bit so that politicians are encouraged to work together rather than against each other to maintain well, power. Andrew Yang's proposal is you need to have open primaries and ranked choice voting. And he thinks that would tilt the scale more towards moderate people in the middle and less from the extremes. And also you have to do something about gerrymandering. I agree with, with, with Yang. I'm yeah, with Yang yeah. on this one. I think, he's, I think he's got a point. Yeah, I think he's a good strategist. Anyway, there's a related issue, which is this war in Ukraine. I was, I watched, I've watched like everybody, these horrible atrocities the Russians are doing. And I said, boy, Putin just seems like another Hitler. And we really should give them all the guns to fight him back. But then the thing that really stopped me was a couple of weeks ago when I realized that Mitch McConnell was all for it and the Republicans are all for it. So Republicans are all for it and the Democrats are all for it. That's not natural. That's not normal. That made me actually think this is probably a mistake. If everybody is, if they're all that much for it, it's probably a mistake. And I now have strong authorities to propose this. I have three sources of people that agree with this position. Henry Kissinger, the Pope, and Marjorie Taylor Greene. Now, you can't argue with three intellectuals like that. No, not and, at all. Yeah. And anyway, because um, I wonder what's really going on. Because my first thought is when I heard Mitch McConnell was for this, is why? And my first thought is because it pumps up military contractors who will then send campaign contributions back to the politicians. And that's what Marjorie Taylor Greene said. It's basically money laundering, which I think is largely true. And what the Pope said, which I thought was outrageous, and after about a week, I decided he's probably right, is this is to test your weapons. They're discovering that the Russian weapons aren't as good as they thought. The Americans are testing all their weapons. These people fight wars to test their new weapons. And uh, I, that also seems not as stupid to me as before. And the other thing that bothered me right from the start is what Henry Kissinger said, which is this is stupid chess. I mean, you can say we're, we're, the, we're the white cowboy at the white hat. We're punching Putin. He's the bad guy and we win. And if all you think about is like a cowboy movie, then you're on the right side. But that is not what you need to do. You need to think, what is the end game? What is the result of this? Apparently, the original thought was we want Putin to stop invading Ukraine. So then the original idea, you put some sanctions on him, and then you go to the bargaining table and say, look, how about you knock it off and we'll take off the sanctions? And then it's over. But that's not what we're doing. Flooding him with more and more weapons, stirring it up more and more. Um, we seem to want to kill Putin or to completely destroy Russia. And that is not a logical goal because Russia is really big and really important. And you need to maintain a balance of power where Russia is part of the game and you can't, although Russia is being very evil, you can't pretend they're much more evil than Saudi Arabia or China or other people. So you, you might pretend you can just wipe them off the board, but you can't, they're big. You have to end up with a balance of power that still has Russia participating in the European Union and the community of nations and turning them into North Korea where everybody hates them is not a desirable end game. And that seems to be where we're going. We it seem to be, what Americans are widely accused of being a bunch of stumbling fools wandering around killing people without having thought through what we're doing and why we're doing it. This reminds me a lot of Rome, where they would in start wars uh, to sort of just not with any end goal in mind, but to boost the political positions of the of the leaders, essentially. I think that's that's what bothers me. The reason why both Republicans and Democrats are supporting it is because they see a personal advantage in it. I think it's. Um, and I think Democrats are very prone to a sort of idealism where they think that we will just do what is right and, and the future will take care of itself. But that is not how you play dip international diplomacy. For example, it would be great if you could get rid of Putin and if you get Russia to act like America, but that is never going to happen. Gorbachev tried it and it failed. They're going to act more like the Soviet Union for the foreseeable future. And we just have to accept that and arrange some kind of surviving with that not pretending we can make it not happen. Sam, I, I, I regret to inform you that you've just regurgitated much of the political thought of the past 30 years, and it's well, not good. very original, and it's certainly not very helpful in the current situation. Well, good. What do you think? Strong words, I know. But starting with Marjorie Taylor Greene, uh, she comes to the extent that she has any identifiable ideology, and... Uh, I think that's a very 
uh, generously applied term in, in her case, it's that she belongs to the uh, ultra reactionary, ultra isolationist wing of right wing thought in uh, American history. And uh, to the extent that she has any kind of resemblance to past figures in American politics, she's entirely consistent with the isolationists uh, in the early 20th century of America, which is pretty much dead, although Trump has managed to revive it somewhat. Oh, yeah, I'm not, I'm not, I certainly am not saying everything she says is right. However, what do you think of the war in Ukraine? Do you think we're doing the right thing? Well, and I'm getting to that. Okay. As far as the Pope is concerned, although he does carry certainly a lot of moral authority, it, uh, now I have not seen this quote from him, but as far as testing weapon systems, that's also transparently false. And the reason why I say that is that the weapon systems being employed in Ukraine are by and large very old. In fact, many of the weapons being used date back to the Cold War and the old Soviet Union. Uh, in particular, Russia has had to pull out of its stores tanks dating back to the 1960s and 1970s. Ukraine has had to do the same. Poland has just donated about 200 T-72 tanks that also date back to the 1970s to Ukraine. Many of the NATO allies are also donating really out of date decommissioned weapons. So it's not a, a, a war of new military technology. Oftentimes it's a, a war of ancient military technology and nearly obsolete technology. And that's well, one of the well, problems Ukraine is facing right now. Well, let me just let me just uh, push back a little on that. You're right with a lot of it, but there's also an interesting battle with drones and anti-drone technology, and not all of that is older out of date. But anyway. No, now that part's not entirely out of date, but a lot of it's not very new. The use of commercial drones for attacking military targets, uh, that's over a decade old. And ISIS used that very effectively going back over 10 years. So that's not new either. It's being used somewhat more systematically in Ukraine, it's true, but still that's nothing new. And the US has been very explicit and the NATO partners have been very explicit in holding back some of the truly cutting edge military technology because they do not want it to fall into the Russians' hands, mm -hmm. which will then allow them to reverse engineer it. And then we'll uh, essentially uh, mean the US and NATO allies forfeiting their technological advantage to Russia and inevitably China too. So the Pope's argument there really doesn't hold water one bit. It's, this is in some ways like a World War I style uh, war because it's an artillery battle. Neither side has air superiority. Um, neither side is able to employ uh, really sophisticated uh, military technology. It's just a, a shell war, an artillery shell war at this point. But the, I think the, the, the most interesting contention here is, is that of Henry Kissinger. And um, I don't think Henry Kissinger deserves much respect Certainly in, in modern uh, political relations theory, I don't think he's given much credence. Certainly his actions in the Vietnam War um, do not uh, support his uh, moral authority. But um, Henry Kissinger's opinions here, to the extent that he is still, um, I don't know, cogent as a thinker, given his advanced age, uh, are also not original. And actually the biggest proponent of this line of thinking that Ukraine should uh, concede territory, that Ukraine should sue for peace, that it's in Ukraine's hands to stop Russian aggression. That's really being uh, in the, the public um, uh, debate, debate sphere is really being pushed most by uh, John Mearsheimer, who is a, a uh, political scientist at the University of Chicago. And he's the one who's really been getting the most press on this. And it's been picked up in a number of corners um, by people who, for whatever reasons, are sympathetic to Russia and or American isolationism. And so what John Mearsheimer has been saying all along is that the US and the NATO partners have provoked Russia and that um, NATO expansionism is responsible for this invasion in Ukraine. Yeah, I've heard that. And that might be true. true. It sounds like it's probably not true. But regardless, what I'm interested in, 
is what is the end game now? Right. So well, I, I'm hearing about this war going on for years, and I'm not hearing any clue of what the goal is and what we accomplish for another couple of years of this war. That's right. And any military action necessarily must resolve via some political settlement. Yeah. And so, yes, some kind of concessions from Ukraine will probably be necessary. And Zelensky in the past week has even hinted that Ukraine would be uh, amenable in some form to some kind of permanent um, uh, loss of territory, possibly going back to the, the, uh, the uh, uh, pre-February uh, 24th uh, uh, lines of demarcation. Yeah, that seems like where it's going to end up. And so, yes, there, there will probably be some kind of territorial I, concessions, possibly. I think something's wrong with your mic. We're getting a buzzing, like a loose wire. Mm. Well, How I can still that? hear you. I think it's better. Go ahead. Okay. All right. So, yes, some kind of concessions will probably be necessary by one or both belligerents. That's that's inevitable in any kind of war, because war is just a, um, a negotiation by different means. Right. But um, the the problem with pushing this as a narrative, well, Ukraine should just roll over, well, Ukraine has the ability to stop this war, is that it, it removes Ukraine's agency. Right. And so you see this on the being argued by many Ukrainians is that, well, what about Ukraine? Doesn't Ukraine have any say in this? It's not a war between NATO and Russia. It's a war between Russia and Ukraine. And it's also a war of choice on the part of Russia. U Ukraine is really the victim in this war. Ukraine never threatened to invade Russia, never attacked Russia. Right. Russia is solely responsible for this war. Well, so, Russia, Russia started it, but now I think it's a proxy war between Russia and America, and Ukraine is just the proxy like Vietnam was. Well, okay, so this is another widespread talking point, and calling it a proxy war is also very problematic, and it comes down to a definition of what is a proxy and what is the role of the powers supporting a proxy. Um, my understanding is that proxies are generally considered like uh, approaching puppets, that the supporters of the proxy state are uh, in fact calling the shots and that they are to some extent controlling that proxy state and that they are using that proxy state to their own political ends. Now, it's definitely true that uh, NATO countries are using this war to their own political ends. That's inevitable in any uh, international event, but you have to keep in mind that the Ukrainian government is certainly not acting at the behest of NATO or the US or the UK, which is what Russia has been alleging mm -hmm. consistently. They are engaged in a fight of self-preservation because uh, if they stop fighting the war, then Russia will take control of the entire country and the U country of Ukraine will cease to exist and given the a very clear pattern of war crimes and indeed uh, genocide on the part of Russian forces, then Ukrainian identity will cease to exist. And so this, this is the really the big problem here for Ukraine is that it, it is a life uh, or death situation for the people and for the country. And so that's not a proxy war. That is not a proxy war because it's, a, it's, a, it's an entirely different set of motivations for the people uh, and government of Ukraine. Now, of course, it's the uh, Ukrainian military is receiving substantial support and the Ukrainian government receiving substantial support from NATO and the European Union. But that doesn't make it a proxy state, just as the Lend-Lease Act in World War II and all the American support for the Soviet Union did not make the Soviet Union a proxy for the United States. Because in the, the Second World War, the Soviet Union was still pursuing its own autonomous political goals, just as today, Ukraine is also pursuing its own autonomous political goals. Okay. And, and also, Sam, I would like to argue against your point and Harry Kissinger's point that the end goal should be our primary focus. 
that we really need to think far ahead and think about what the end goal of our intervention should always be. Um, I would argue that sometimes doing the right thing at the right time, um, it's just as important as thinking about the end goals and can even sort of supersede, you know, the, the, you know, the long-term end goals. Uh, so I'm thinking, for example, like America, for example, was very late into entering World War II because we had this hands-off policy of what's in Europe is Europe's deal. In retrospect, we really should have gotten in there sooner. Uh, you know, there was a genocide happening. There was um, a, a moral obligation uh, for America's military to sort of step in. And because we did not step in uh, earlier, we actually sort of extended World War II a bit. Um, oh, yes. We certainly failed to intervene quick enough yeah. then. Right. And, we, and I'm not saying we should never have helped Ukraine at all, but we don't seem to be doing any progress towards a negotiated settlement with Russia. We just seem to be inflaming it more and more. Like, why are we throwing another 40 billion of, of weapons there now? It really seems like we want this war to continue and we want it to grow for some reason of our own, well, not because, to do with Ukraine. Well, what Alan pointed out, rightly so, is that Ukraine is the victim in this situation. I mean, there's a lot of wars you can sort of say, well, there's, you know, sort of both sides going on. Yeah. You know, but in this case, no, Ukraine was just minding its own business and then it got invaded by Russia, uh, presumably because Putin has gone a little crazy. Um, and so, I think there's a moral imperative for not just the US, but for nations around the world to say this is not appropriate. Of course. And, and of course, you know, yeah, there's, you know, when, you know, you can really think about the long term, you know, is this really going to help America trade? Because Russia is one of our biggest trade partners. You know, is this going to really help our economy? Maybe, probably well, not. Bit, you know, I, but yeah, I mean, there's, but there's a moral obligation. But we should we, have been talking to Russia. We should have been telling Russia what they should do to make us forgive them and bring them back onto terms like before, right from nearly the start. And we don't seem to have any interest in saying that at all. We seem to be pretending that we can crush them and destroy them utterly. I, I don't think we are invading Russia the same way Russia is invading Ukraine. As far no. as I know, we're, we're defending Ukraine. And if we if we were, I would I would agree with your sentiment. If the United States decided, oh, we're going to go into like Moscow and you know see how they like it. Okay, I I would agree with you at that point. That's too far. But but uh, you know I it's it's very obvious what Russia needs to do to end this conflict. They need to not invade Ukraine. They need to pull out. Well, it, I'm see that's what that's what we have not been saying, and I'm not sure it's true at all. And by the way, I think it's the same as my my other political issue here. I do not think that we. Americans know or care about Ukraine. We are not there to save Ukraine. We are there because we hate Russia. I and don't think that's is, the case at all, Sam. You know, well, that's certain. Well, that would be nice. But uh, um, Sam, I, I have to point out here that uh, um, one of the peculiarities of your argument, mm -hmm. and you're not alone in making this argument, I think Noam Chomsky has also been guilty of this recently, is that on the one hand, you are denying the agency of Ukraine as a nation and as a people. Yeah. On the other hand, you're also denying the agency of Russia and the Russian government. We just went over how this is a, a war fundamentally of self-defense for Ukraine because mm -hmm. they have been invaded by an aggressor. Yep. But on the other hand, you're also saying that Russia is somehow a victim or that it is not fully responsible for its own actions. No. And this no, is a, a line of no. argument that, that I, I think- I don't saying that at all. Well, you're, you're implying it. No, I'm saying that the United States has stepped in. We are a monster. We're enormously powerful. We could now pressure everybody to do things. And we are not using that pressure to bring about a logical end to this conflict. We are using that pressure to just ramp it up and make it rage hot. No, 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 that's entirely not true. I mean, it, you're, you're implying, in making this argument, you're implying that the U.S. somehow has outsized influence, that I it is somehow able to manipulate other countries yes, I think to an are. extent that it simply cannot. And oh. in this exactly, this, this exactly uh, supports my argument here that uh, you're denying the agency of Russia, because Russia, it, it is a superpower of a kind. Mm -hmm. It is a nuclear power. It was, until this war, considered the second greatest military in the world. Yeah. much 
Um, and so Russia uh, has tremendous, had tremendous military and economic leverage, even though it was corrupt and a dictatorship. And that's certainly gone down. Yes. And yet by insisting that the US was somehow able to influence Russia, denies or understates the full extent of Russia's autonomy and its own ability to set its own course. Well, yeah, I think being in a war against them is all about that. But anyway, all right. anyway. So I, I think I think yeah. we stumbled upon, and I don't mean to go off on a, on a huge other tangent, but yeah. that a lot of our government seems so big and so powerful, including the military. It seems like we should be able to like control Russia. And 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 from an outsider's perspective, you know, that's the sort of propaganda that the United States military puts out. Uh, but a lot of that is is propaganda. The, the United States military is not all powerful. Um, and a lot of other parts of the US government structure, like I, I learned this firsthand, um, like at NASA, where people think it's this super high tech place where you know, everything is in like VR and all this stuff. And then you, you visit NASA and you realize things are sort of held together by like duct tape and like the Apollo mission, things were being shipped around in people's trunks of their cars because they didn't know how to get the rocket parts to each other. I mean, it's, you know, it's very easy to overestimate, you know, the, the US government's capabilities. And, and in part that is because that's on purpose because that's what the US government wants you to believe. All right. Well, anyway, let's go on to the next one, which is Alan on climate change. Yes. Yeah, speaking of uh, subjects that are never resolved, climate change, uh, according to a, a large study conducted by uh, 20 different researchers at uh, many different institutions all over the world, um, they have found that um, uh, climate change is directly responsible for the quote unquote early heat uh, in India and Pakistan and has made it 30 times more likely. Uh, of course, India and Pakistan are in the midst of a very serious heat wave right now. This is on top of uh, a, a drought. And um, there's a, been a very clear pattern of worsening conditions in India and Pakistan for a number of years now. Desertification, falling water tables, uh, more and more extreme heat waves, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, in this study, these many, many different researchers uh, examined specifically the 2022 heat wave, though, the one that's actually still ongoing. Um, and they found that, uh, and for reasons that are probably too complex to get into here, they found that the, this heat wave and other heat waves are much more, um, shall we say, uh, provably correlated with climate change. And whenever there's some kind of natural disaster, you know, so a hurricane or uh, devastating floods or a bunch of tornadoes, you'll hear the, the, the oft repeated line that um, you cannot attribute that event to climate change. So it's like a, a standard disclaimer almost, which I think has the unfortunate effect of making people think that climate change isn't actually changing the climate in, in disastrous ways. But what this study tried to do is actually look at uh, climate change in India and Pakistan over the past uh, 40 years or so, uh, because the, the data is not very strong prior to 1979. Um, and what they found was that in addition to the uh, 1.2 degrees Celsius of global warming, um, they found that the probability of an event such as the heat wave right now in 2022 uh, is 30 times more likely, thanks to the uh, climate change, than it would have been had there been no climate change whatsoever. Yeah, so it's I, a very, I, yeah. it, it's a compelling argument here. Oh yeah, it's hard to see how anybody could deny climate change. The effects are huge everywhere now. Yeah, and even a, a majority of Republicans um, b uh, believe in climate change. There's still debate as to uh, who is responsible for it, but... Uh, Yes, uh, it, it's becoming more and more mainstream. Yeah. All right. And Caitlin's got at and I should unmute myself first. I, I do have AT&T. <laughs> and 
uh, they're getting in a bit of trouble as usual, as one, one expects them to do. Uh, so TechDirt has an article uh, written by uh, Carl Bode uh, talking about a quote unquote bullshit wireless fee. Now we all know that a lot of these fees that you're, are strapped onto your cell phone bills are questionable at best. Uh, they want to sell you on a plan that's $100 a month, and then it ends up being like $200 a month because of all the regulation fees and stuff like this. Well, in particular, there was a surcharge called an administrative fee. It turns out administrative fee is fees that go to AT&T to maintain their AT&T stuff, which is the same thing as an AT&T bill. <laughs> like, like, what's the difference? There is no difference, uh, but they charged extra. Uh, for the administration fee. And uh, they made millions of dollars on this. And so they got in trouble. Uh, they had to pay back a little bit of it, but it definitely was not enough to cover the amount of money they essentially stole from customers. Yeah, so, and it's yeah. the same thing I've been doing for all my life. <laughs> yeah. So uh, New York Times has an article by Jack Ewing about Tesla. Are, are you done, Caitlin? Oh, I'm done. I had to fix my, okay. my camera. Right. Anyway, but the, um, and I was, it summarizes what I've been watching with horror for the last week, which is uh, Elon Musk apparently going nuts, making a complete jackass for himself on Twitter, and apparently nobody can stop him. Um, so it's revealed, I think, what everyone in the industry has known for a long time, which is Tesla stock is wildly overvalued. It's at least five times higher than it should be. And Tesla has a very uncertain future because everybody else is now coming up with electronic, electric vehicles to compete with them. And they appear to be being run by an unaccountable madman. There doesn't seem to be any functioning board of directors to make him stop saying stupid things and breaking laws constantly. So um, he, it was all based on a cult of personality of people worshiping Elon and believing that he is going to do something great later. So it's worth paying this high price for Tesla. And that faith is now being shattered. So Tesla is falling. Elon's attempt to buy Twitter is almost certainly doomed because the falling price of Tesla means he can't borrow the money he was going to borrow to pay for Twitter. And um, now he's talking uh, about uh, putting, using his SpaceX stock to support buying Twitter. And buying Twitter never made any sense anyway. And so um, it, it's looking really bad for Tesla and looking really bad for Elon. And now he's got a sexual abuse allegation and he responded to it with a very defensive, outrageous statement that he's going to hire a bunch of lawyers and he's going to switch from Democrat to Republican to punish people who dare to accuse him of such things. So it, it just, it looks like his self-destruction is blazing and it looks like Tesla is going to go down with it unless the board of directors actually wakes up and decides that they need to discipline or push him out, which is what ought to happen. You're supposed to have a board of directors at a company that does not let the CEO do crazy things. <laughs> But that does not seem to be true. Anyway, that's the joy of Elon Musk. And Alan has pimps. Yeah, a, a very tacky and salacious titled uh, article, The E-Pimps of OnlyFans from the New York Times Magazine. But it's actually a really interesting article because it talks about uh, an aspect of the uh, OnlyFans ecosystem that I was not aware of. Uh, OnlyFans, of course, is best known though is not exclusively for um, models who post often adult content, um, which is available to subscribers. Um, and it's also a platform for sharing not only videos, but images and uh, chatting too. Um, for uh, those of you who are more familiar with this platform, you'll have to excuse my ignorance. I'm not a user of this, so I don't really know how it works. But according to this article, um, the, uh, the content creators, the, the models, um, uh, want to cultivate relationships with uh, their clients, their viewers on the OnlyFans platform. And um, that requires a lot of work um, because you might have between 20 and 50 clients uh, messaging you every single day. And if you don't message them back, then they aren't going to remain your client for very long. And then you aren't going to be able to sell your content. Mm -hmm. So there seems to have sprung up a little cottage industry of companies 
that actually take on a lot of the OnlyFans account management for the models. And uh, that includes providing people who will carry out conversations, these chats, um, or other administrative tasks. And for the, the, this trouble, these, uh, these companies will take a cut of the business. You can think of them as marketing agencies. And so they might take anywhere between 10 and 70% of the model's revenue, monthly revenue, which can be substantial. Some models are making more than $40,000, $50,000 a month on the only flat, uh, fans platform, although most do not. Most make just a pittance, less than $1,000. Um, so anyway, uh, it's a lengthy article, but one of the interesting dimensions is that we see a mirroring of uh, basically global label, uh, labor arbitrage that we've seen on other digital platforms. Um, these marketing agencies hire out people from around the world, English speakers, um, but in countries that uh, command where workers command a much lower wage than in the US. So uh, the Philippines being a popular destination and uh, these chatters, as they're called, these are the people who work for the marketing agencies who carry on these conversations with the models clients. They're getting paid maybe $3 an hour, uh, writing basically very suggestive uh, chats and providing companionship to the clients. And so um, that's, a, that's about as far as this article takes it, but it's still in a really interesting economy that's happening here. Uh, in OnlyFans. And it'll be interesting to see if this, first of all, this platform continues. It may not. Uh, and also to see if it expands further. Yeah. I've heard, well, I've read about it. This OnlyFans is very popular with the sex workers. They say it's a good way for them to make a living, beating their alternative for, options. Yes, for a handful. Yeah. But it's one of these 90-10 situations where 90% of the profits go to just 10% of the people working. Well, basically what you've got here is a sort of gig work for people in other countries to basically write pornography and sell it and get a living, get a living that way. Well, yes, but it's not just writing pornography, you know, pornographic uh, fiction. Say. It's actually cultivating personal relationships, which yeah. is what makes it especially interesting is that it's mm -hmm. not just, ultimately it's not uh, just about uh, uh, smutty pictures and videos right it's about uh a kind of emotional intimacy yeah and uh so that makes an especially interesting type of work uh, in a very interesting uh, shall we say global economic model too yeah there's quite a bit of this i know i've read articles about you know how in japan you can have the girlfriend experience and somebody uh online pretends to be your girlfriend and makes the demands your girlfriend would make of you and stuff Oh, well, that's not exclusive to Japan. I mean, that's very common in the US. In fact, for a long time, um, you had uh, sex workers on Instagram advertising uh, the girlfriend experience. There's even a movie called The Girlfriend Experience, okay. if I recall correctly. So yeah, but that's been around for a very long time. And, and um, yeah, I think, uh, I don't know what it's like in Europe, but it's, I imagine it's, it's pretty common throughout uh, the, the richer countries of the world. So this is basically a new form of entertainment. Well, it's not just entertainment though. Uh, and this is, this is what makes the, the chatters work so interesting is that it's a form of emotional labor. Sure. Emotional and social labor. Uh, in that they are creating this uh, impression or appearance of, of intimacy, of social yeah. intimacy. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. Different than other forms. Yes. All right. And uh, so Caitlin's got programming language design. Yeah, this is something I've been saying for a long time. So there's this blog, and I'm not sure the real name of the person who writes this blog. They go by Love to Code, or and their website is called Pointers Gone Wild. Um, and apparently, they do a lot of research into programming languages. And one of the things that they talk about is the importance of minimalism in programming languages. And I full heartedly agree with this. Uh, I've been saying for a long time that there's been this push for technological advances within programming languages, and they've just become more bloated and complex over time to the point where they're really hindering development. Um, and you have 
languages that buck the train, tra that trend and become popular like Python. Uh, but then over a while, Python becomes more and more bloated and you have Python 3 and you have, for example, they added the walrus, uh, um, what is it called? The walrus operator, I believe it's called walrus. Walrus, yeah, the walrus operator. So what the walrus operator does in Python is that if you want to declare a variable in the middle of a statement, you can use the walrus operator. Now I've been programming for a long time in Python. I've never had a need for the walrus operator. The person who runs the Python foundation or runs the, the Python uh, decisions actually quit <laughs> when the walrus operator got introduced into Python 3 uh, because it is it just makes the simple the language that was very simple become more and more bloated and you start having things like languages that are designed to be iterative so they have like lambda operators built in and stuff like that uh, which really does not make programs run faster or be more efficient uh, but it can i suppose make your code a little prettier and it's technologically very interesting but it's just more bloat and bloat and bloat on the programming language um, and so in particular the article talks about uh, how if there was this push back in the C++ era to make everything object-oriented and everyone said, oh, our programs are gonna be so much simpler if everything's an object. Well, in practice, that really was not the case at all. Some things are not better as objects. <laughs> Some things are just quite frankly functions and they're just fine just being functions. Um, and there was a good example of converting a code base in C to Rust and having an awful time about it because Rust is such a, a, a somewhat complex language, especially with the way it, it deals with like returns uh, and stuff that uh, they said that the Rust uh, compiler makes me feel like I'm stupid. <laughs> um, and, you know, just having simple languages is something that really has, has not been done before, focusing on just like what is the bare minimum of a language to get things done hasn't really been the focus of a language since C. And I, and I still use C, I love C. Mm -hmm. um, but having these sort of simplest, simple minimalist languages are, are just completely out of fashion and they should not be, that should be the start of a programming language. Uh, and so I'm glad that this is, this is, this philosophy is gaining more traction. So hopefully we'll see some more programming languages moving forward, that instead of trying to be technologically advanced and have all the features, really focus on having a core set of features done well and just stick to that. I think C was a good example of that. Yes, I do too. Uh, the only problem with C is that it was written before computer security was a known factor. Right. So it's very easy to make mistakes that are supported by the language. Uh, so you know, if you had just C, but the standard library, <laughs> would not allow you to, you know, do things that would put your code at risk. I mean, that would be perfect. Yeah. Well, you know, DEF CON turned down my COBOL CTF. I feel abused. Everything after COBOL was just a mistake. Anyway. Uh, yeah. I, I, actually, AGOL, I think, was the pinnacle of languages. ALGOL. ALGOL, yeah. 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 I did. I thought I, was, I almost wrote an ALGOL CTF, but I managed to restrain myself. Anyway. Um. All right. And so... Uh, Gizmodo has an article saying that there's another company like NSO that wrote a whole bunch of exploits and sold them to governments. And it's so bad that Google Threat Analytics has found that most of the zero day vulnerabilities they discovered were written by these exploit companies, the spyware companies to make weapons to sell to governments. So I'm not sure if this should exactly be a surprise, but it shows kind of that it's uh, it's these companies that are creating and disseminating the zero days. It's not criminal syndicates exactly. So, you know, maybe we'll be all right if we, we can have, Ronald Reagan used to say, organized crime is better than disorganized crime. So anyway, uh, it's the increased professionalism of the exploit market, I think. And Alan has got, uh, oh, Broadcom, Broadcom buying VMware. Yeah, this is probably the biggest news in the, uh, m a space and technology, Broadcom, the very significant um, 
manufacturers of uh, silicon and uh, random other companies that have nothing to do with silicon wants to buy broad or wants to buy uh, VMware and uh, the deal might close in just this week or possibly next week. Um, Does Dell is, own VMware now? Somebody bought them before, right? Yeah, it's changed hands a bunch of times. It went yeah. to Dell, it went to EMC, it got spun off and now it's independent. Um, nobody seems to really know what to do with VMware because its heyday was about 10 years ago, maybe 12 years ago when it looked like it was the future. And now thanks to AWS and cloud computing, it's still important, but definitely less prominent to the future in the future. Yeah. Um, but it's still worth about $60 billion, at least to Broadcom. Um, and uh, a lot of head scratching about this one, because why would Broadcom have any interest in buying VMware? This article here on Network World, written by uh, Michael Cooney, senior editor, um, is probably the best analysis I've read of why Broadcom would want to do this, even though he too doesn't have all the clear answers because I think it's just a head scratcher. Broadcom um, bought uh, CA Technologies uh, a few years back, and then they bought Symantec shortly thereafter. And they bought Symantec for $10 billion, which seems like an awfully steep price to pay for a security company that really, well, its heyday was in the 1990s, I think. <laughs> Yeah. It's not relevant anymore. And I don't know if their products even figure on the, the Gartner Magic Quadrant, which is pretty bad for a $10 billion company. Anyway, um, so Broadcom hasn't really succeeded in leveraging synergies with those two acquisitions. It seems unlikely they'll be able to leverage synergies with VMware also. I, my one thought is that possibly there could be some kind of vertical integration here where you have uh, Broadcom chips somehow optimizing VMware installations somehow, and then this will allow Broadcom to uh, have greater market penetration in data centers and uh, software or something. But it sounds like a bad move. Yeah, it's hard to see. Yeah. All right. Well, that's all for this one. And we'll be back on Friday.